Welcome once again, this is Pinnacle Professional College, and today we'll be bringing you an insightful lecture and case study analysis on the August 2022 examinations for the ICA. So please stick and stay with me um, as I go through the strategic case study. Um, it's important to assimilate the information step by step. So I'd recommend that you get a pen, you get a paper, because I'll be giving some pointers as I walk through the case. Now, one of the important things which you need to know as you go through the case is to have an understanding of some key models, you know, and it helps you as you move through the case because these models are, I would say fundamental models that need to be understood by anyone taking the examination, right? So um, I'll mention some of those models. I've done previous lectures on that. And so you can definitely take a, take a look at those lectures and it will be very, very helpful to you. Um, so first of all, let me mention some of the models that you probably need to look at and have a refresh on. And I'll be discussing some of these models as I run through the analysis. Um, but first of all, you need to at least, so I, I call them the 10 fundamental models. There are other strategic models that you need to know, but these ones are quite crucial. Number one is the pestle framework. So you're looking at the political, ecological, economic, um, social, technological, legal factors. Uh, you have the Porter's five forces. You have SWOT analysis. Um, SWOT analysis is something you'll be doing as you walk through the case because you want to understand the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that face the company you are look at, looking at or you're trying to analyze. And then you have the balance scorecard. You have ANSOFT's matrix. You have BCG growth matrix. You have the Porter's value chain, McKinsey's 7S model. Lewin's change money management model and the competitive positioning matrix. So there are a lot of strategic models. Um, so, um, but we'll try and as I go through the case, we'll try and touch on these models that I mentioned. And it's important to do your revision on the other, mod, other models as well. So um, today, so I'll, my approach would be this, because anytime you are analyzing uh, a case study, you need to understand that every sentence gives you some information. You know, every sentence gives you some information. So my approach would be to take it sentence by sentence and sometimes paragraph by paragraph and try to extract what the paragraph is saying or the sentence is saying, and then give some pointers as to what we should be looking at and what exactly we should be expecting in terms of you know, the models to look at, in terms of the direction of the company, in terms of the vision or the mission of the organization. So first off, let's, let's, let's go ahead. So the introduction, a case study will typically have the introduction, which will basically introduce you to the organization. So Bazaar Stores Company Limited, is one of the largest food retailers in Ghana, employing over 2,500 staff in over 75 locations across the country. Now, when I read this statement, the first thing that comes to mind is limited. Limited. So most likely, or possibly, this company is most likely a limited liability company. So what is a limited liability company? You would want to understand that, you know, it comes from the word limited liability. So the liability of the company is kind of limited because the shareholders who have invested the company um, are, are separate from the entity, right? And so when there are any losses, you know, or there are any bankruptcy issues, it affects typically the company. It affects typically the company. So if you want to understand what a limited liability company is, um, it, it will be good to understand that, you know, to understand the nature of the business, 
to understand the nature of the business. So as I, as I already mentioned, um, as I already mentioned, limited liability means, um, essentially means that um, the liability of the investors, right? Or those who have invested in the business is only limited to the capital they have contributed to that particular business. So let's say if I've invested in bazaar stores and I've invested 5,000, my liability in bazaar stores is only limited to the capital I've contributed. And that's why it's called a limited liability. You know, so me as an investor or a partner of the company, um, the, my, my, my investment is limited to the amount of I've contributed. So what does this mean? In other words, it means that the investors and the owner's private assets are not at risk if the company fails. So if the company fails and they have to go through some bankruptcy of some sort, right? They can't come after the private assets of the owners or of the investors, right? So let's say Bazaar Stores Company fails totally, right? It goes bankrupt and I've invested $50,000 in it, right? If I've invested $50,000, it means that's what I'll lose, right? They can't come after my house or my personal car um, and liquidate it to kind of like pay for their debts, right? So that's the meaning of limited liability. It's important to understand what it means. And it says it's one of the largest food retailers. So we are looking at market share here, right? We are looking at market share. Right? And when we look at market share, um, one of the things um, as we walk through the case, very, very, um, one of the things you would want to understand um, the marketing models you want to understand is the four P's, right? And the four P's are basically place, product, price, and promotion, right? So these are the four P's, right? Another thing too you'd want to know is the market share. You know, what's the market share of the company? Um, you know, how are they um, performing? In their industry. Now, clearly, Bazaars is a huge brand. They employ over 2,500 staff. So, the implication here is their payroll is going to be quite huge. And there are over 75 locations across the country. Now, when you see something like 75 locations across the country, you must understand that in, you know, in Ghana, there are different regions. Right, and in different regions, um, there are different ways of doing things. Right, so um, and particularly the taste of the people, the you know the demand of the people for particular products is different. Right, and um, because people are different across different regions, so um, it will be interesting to understand you know what kind of strategy they have in place in terms of how they approach the different locations in the country. Another thing too that must come to your mind when you see locations is also location profitability. How profitable are the locations? Are some locations making money? Are some locations losing money? And is it even sensible to close some locations because they do not make money at all, et cetera? Analysis like that. Right, analysis like that. So it's very, very important. So in that first sentence, we can see something around what market share, right? You can see something around market share. You can also see, uh, uh, and you can also see information about human capital, 2,500 staff. That's a huge army of people. That's going to mean a huge payroll. It means that a lot of people depend on this organization for jobs. And you also see um, locations, locations. So that's very, very important to understand. That's very, very important to understand. So Bazaar started its business operations over 64 years ago. Now, 
it means that the time a company starts its operation is crucial or the era within which a company starts its operation is crucial because times change. 64 years ago, you couldn't talk much about, you know, you know there, there was technology, but it was quite screwed. Right now, there are a lot of advancements in technology, social media, 64 years ago, you can't talk about social media. So how business is even done, you know, has changed has changed totally and it has changed radically. So the timing, you know, you need to understand what era were they in. It was an era where technology was not necessarily at its peak. Um, it was a time where um, there was a lot of traditional methods of doing business. Um, it was a time where um, brick and mortar was the thing. So when you say brick and mortar, um, it means the actual buildings, you know, were set up where, you know, set products were sold. But these days, products can be sold online. So you have brick and mortar business where you have a physical location where, um, where you know, people come and buy stuff, you know. But these days, you can go online and, and it's not brick and mortar. You just go online and then you, um, you, you make your purchase. Now, another thing that locations bring about, which I didn't mention, was if these locations are brick and mortar, then it will mean that you would have to pay for, you know, renting the place. And though that's also another additional expenditure which is going to impact the financials of the company. But as we go through, we would see exactly um, how things look like. So, it started its business operations over 64 years ago, just after Ghana gained their independence. So that's why I said this statement is very key because it gives you the timing. You know, it gives you the timing. Ghana had gained its independence. You know, there will probably be a shift to Ghana-based products, right? And as you can see, they always had a reputation for high quality goods clean and efficient stores and a very professional approach to its business, very professional approach to its business. So, so this is a company that has had a very, very good reputation, very, very good re reputation. And um, another thing to would like to understand is, you know, the company life cycle, the company life cycle, right? Since this company started, 64 years ago, they are prop so they are basically four phases in the four fundamental phases in the company life cycle. You have the introductory phase, you have the growth phase, you have the maturity phase, and then you have the decline phase. Since this company started about 64 years ago, that would most likely mean that they've moved out of their introductory phase and in probably in the growth or maturity phase. Um, we haven't delved into more details to understand exactly where they are, but they are probably in the growth or maturity phase. Um, maybe possibly maturity, I guess, or growth um, could be possibly maturity, or maybe who knows, maybe they are on their way to decline, but in, more information would help us determine that. So um, this is a company that has a huge brand, um, very, very, um, very, very, uh, very, very good when it comes to efficient stores, high quality goods. So, you know, they are, in terms of the four piece products, products are high quality, right? Place, efficient stores, you know, they have very, very good efficient stores, you know? And in terms of the balance scorecard, right? When you look at the balance scorecard, one of the things or the parameters in the balance scorecard, are customer objectives, customer objectives. And customer objectives, you are looking at stuff like um, improving customer satisfaction, improving the clarity of the offering. So it looks like they have quite a clear offering. They are looking to satisfy their customers, et cetera, right? One of the key things when it comes to running a business is reputation. You know, reputation is an intangible asset, right? It's an intangible asset and um, 
it adds to the value of the organization. So the reason why someone would buy, let's say, an Apple product over a normal phone is, you know, brand and the reputation that Apple has built over the years. So this company has a good track record of its dealings with the public with a limited bad press and has remained ethical and loyal to the community that it serves. So it's, you know, so this is when you look at the SWOT analysis, right? Which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, strengths and weaknesses focus on the internal environment, opportunities and threats focus on the external environment. So um, certainly this company has a huge strength um, in terms of you know, their reputation, their ethics, and their loyalty to, to the community. These are all strengths that are good for the business. They also have um, high quality goods, the reputation for high quality goods, et cetera. You know. So, so, so in that first paragraph, we've captured, captured a lot of things and it's important, um, I'm sure you have your notebook and your pen with you. It's important to capture these points um, as you go along. So let's move on to the second paragraph. Bazaar had expanded to most regional capitals. You know, so it looks like they have a regional approach to dominating the market, right? So, they, you know, there are different regions and they've expanded to those regions and districts from its humble beginning in Accra and now has about 10 stores in the northern parts of Ghana, especially border towns in the north, east and west. So this sentence is basically showing us the trajectory, you know, from the introductory phase and how it's transitioned into the growth phase where and the expansion phase where it's moved into different regions and the regional capitals and has served customers there. As I already mentioned, the market share is key, right? Because as you venture into different markets, um, you, you are able to access more, more and more customers. And you can see that Bazaar's market share continued to grow during the last decade, continued to grow during the last decade, which is, which is quite interesting, right? Um, I mean, it's not surprising because of their expansion strategy. Um, so you can see that continue, continued growth, and which is very, very important. It is very, very important. Um, now, now let's move on to the next sentence. The industry as a whole, right now, so right now, if you look at this, we are carefully transitioning from the company to the industry, right? The company to the industry. Now, if you want to do an analysis on an industry, an analysis on an industry and place it within the context of the company, um, one of the key things you might want to look at is the Porter's Five Forces Framework. Porter's Five Forces Framework. And also another model you might want to look at is the Porter's Diamond, the Porter's Diamond. Um, in the Porter's Five Forces Framework, we are looking at things around, you know, threats, like you are looking at threats of substitute products, bargaining power of suppliers, bargaining power of buyers, threats of new entrants, rivalry, among existing competitors. So the industry as a whole is becoming increasingly segmented between the big four supermarkets. Um, so apparently there are big four supermarkets and it's becoming increasingly segmented. So the market is being segmented. What does market segmentation mean? Market segmentation basically means that um, the market is kind of like divided right? The market is divided in a sense between the four big supermarkets, high quality goods, pleasant shopping atmosphere with visible security make shoppers feel secure, you know? So these are some of the high points in the industry, you know, in the industry. So you have this whole shopping atmosphere that makes people feel at home 
when they are shopping and secure and secure. You know? So this is, we are getting some information from industry, you know, from industry, from the industry. But what does this mean? The industry as a whole is becoming increasingly segmented between the big four supermarkets, right? It means that there's some form of competition going on. The competitive landscape is not that easy, right? So the market has been segmented between four big supermarkets, right? So these supermarkets are going head to head. So one of the key models that I mentioned earlier is the competitive positioning matrix. And this matrix helps you to understand bazaar, uh, where bazaar stands, bazaar store stands in relation to its competitors, in relation to its competitors. So where does it stand? You know, where does it sit with in relation to its competitors? All right, so that's very, very important. And that's what we want to know from that statement. Bazaar sells a wide range of products and some of the shops tend to be discount stores, right? So two things here. Now, when you see a statement like two things here, we can go back to our four Ps, which is product, place, price, promotion. Here, you are seeing variety in products, product variety. So that's one of the Ps. And some of the shops tend to be discount stores. So here you are looking at price, pricing. Now, why would bazaar stores have some stores as discount stores? It's probably part of their pricing strategy where you know they, they basically uh, discount, you know, make some stores discount yeah, to drive revenue, you know, or possibly as a marketing strategy to you know, to get more customers, to get more customers. Like most retail outlets, the company is highly centralized. So here we are talking about structure, structure. And in the McKinsey Surveillance model, one of the key things is structure. Structure is basically how the company is organized. So this is a highly centralized company, um, not only in terms of, employee relation decisions, but in as most aspects of management policy, such as buying decisions, store layout, pricing, financial controls, and preferred management. So this is a centralized um, structure. Now I talked about the McKinsey 7S model. So just to refresh your memory on that, it's basically seven S's. So number one is strategy, number two is structure, Number three is systems. Number four is shared values. Number five is staff. And number, um, number six is um, skills. And, um, and number seven, let me go through one more time. Um, number one is structure. Number two is strategy. Number three is skill. Number four is system. Number five is shared value. Number six is style. And number seven staff. Here, we are looking at a centralized structure. So there are two types of structures. They're centralized and decentralized. A centralized structure where it basically means the power to make decisions is centered at the top and does not devolve to lower levels in the organization. A decentralized structure is the opposite. You know, power has been devolved to lower levels of the organizations so that power to make decisions happen even at the lower levels, but centralized, you know, the authority to make decisions sits at the top and lower levels, lower level employees in the organization basically receive orders from the top. So that's why you see that buying decision, pricing, financial controls, et cetera, are done, um, are done by, you know, the seniors at the top, the seniors at the top. So, some few things to ask yourself from these two paragraphs, you know, what have you got, we gathered so far? We've gathered, you know, the, we, we, we kind of understand, you know, the product strategy, the pricing strategy, um, 
you know, even some level of the promotion strategy, because as part of their promotion, um, they probably um, want to, you know, expand into different locations and get their faces, you know, get their, get themselves in, in the eyes of the customer, basically, in the eyes of the customer. So as you are going through this, you should think of the strengths, weaknesses you are seeing here. Now let's move on to the next paragraph, the next paragraph. There is tremendous rivalry between the market leaders, both at national level and locally, with new stores opening, having immediate effects upon sales in those areas, right? So like I mentioned, the Porter's Five Forces is key here. And one of the forces is competitive rivalry, competitive rivalry. And what does it talk about when we look at competitive rivalry? We're looking at stuff like the diversity of the competitors, the number of competitors, you know, you know how concentrated the industry is, you know, stuff like that. And you can clearly see that there's a lot of rivalry here. So this is a very tough um, industry, you know, and there's also close attention paid to the activities of competitors in terms of what they do in terms of now look at, look carefully at the things they are paying attention to. Number one is what price. Number two is product range. Number three is store design. Um, that you know, number three is store design. So these are three key things that they are, you know, paying attention to, and these are critical success factors. If you want to succeed in an industry like this, these are these are things you should have at a minimum. Right, your pricing should be solid, your product should be solid, and your store design should be amazing. You know, and it should you know incorporate high tech to facilitate services to shoppers. There has been a rush to open new stores in attractive locations, increasingly out of town, to cater for the one-stop shop shoppers. Indeed, over the last few years, each of the major multiples has moved further up market, aiming to target more quality conscious co consumers, you see. So there is intense competition and it's making people, you know, the participants in the industry find creative ways of reaching out to customers, you know, you know reaching out to customers. Customer demand also varies considerably, but usually in a fairly predictable manner throughout the course of the day, week and year, right? So one of the things you might see here is variation in customer demand. And you might also see here seasonality, you know? So like during Christmas times, probably demand will be higher sales and that will impact sales, right? So it's something to take note of. Customer demand varies considerably, right? but usually in a fairly predictable manner throughout the course of the day, week, and year. So maybe probably particular days, demand is high, you know, particular times of the year, demand is high. So it goes on to explain this. Now, why do we need this information? Why do we need to understand consumer demand or customer demand, right? We need to understand the demand patterns of our customers because that's eventually going to impact our revenue, right? And even also drive the product, um, how, we shelf our, how we shelf our products, you know, that's very, very important. So for instance, sales tend to increase during the week with peak on Saturdays, you know, because Saturdays people are home, you know, Sunday afternoons, people would have done whatever they want to do in the morning. And then in the afternoons, they can do their shopping and, and travel on Wednesday mornings, you know? So basically it dips on Wednesday mornings, but it tends to increase during the week. And the peak is on Saturday and Sunday afternoon. So if you have this information as a customer value, Analysts, what, what do you do with this information? You know that on Saturday and Sunday afternoons, your, your, you know, that's where your demand is high, right? 
that's where your demand is high. So what would you possibly do, right? It means that you must, you know, make sure you have enough inventory to meet that demand, to meet that demand so that you don't lose on revenue. In times when demand falls, then you must come up as an organization with creative ways to increase your footfall, to increase the number of people who come into your store to make a purchase. This has implications for the number of staff employed. Exactly. Very, very important. So the people, you know, the people employed, it's also going to, because if it's a peak moment where there are a lot of customers trying to buy, then you need more, you know, more, more staff. This has implications for the number of staff employed at any one time. And it provides a rationale for the high proportion for the high proportion of part-time staff, right? Right. So we need to understand as an organization for bazaar, you know, should they be employing full-time staff or part-time staff? Or should they have a mix of full-time and part-time staff? You know, how should they go about it? And which divisions in Bazaar Limited should have full-time staff and which divisions should have part-time staff? This is a critical conversation analysis to be made, right? But typically what you would see is that majority of the staff on the sales floor would be part-timers, right? And we want to understand the mix between part-time and full-time because a full-time employee, you know, you would have, you would spend a lot more, you know, about 65% of employees are part-time. So we are told here that 65% of employees are part-time. So that's a huge percentage, right? And they are typically young people, I would assume, yes. A large proportion of the staff are young, although those employed on the checkout are just as likely to be in their mid thirties and early forties due to the demand of the roles and responsibilities in the shop floors, right? So don't, don't always remember this. It's people that drive revenue, right? So when there's high demand, you need people there to be able to support, to be able to support. And so you need to understand the kind of people you're employing and when the whether they will be able to be reliable enough to serve that demand. As is the practice in the banking sector. So we even see this in other sectors as well. Employees provide the numerical flexibility, manage, uh, flexibility management at peak time. And this is deemed to be appropriate. So, First of all, we need to understand, okay, who are our people? What percentage is part-time? What percentage currently is full-time? You know, so do we have to increase the part-timers and decrease? This is all around the HR strategy. So the human resource strategy is something you would want to look deeply into, right? Should we move from 65 to 75% part-time. And also, basically, when you're thinking of HR strategy, you're thinking about acquisition or recruitment, retention, and employee management. And you're also thinking of reward and recognition. So these are four fundamental areas when you, when you think about human resource strategy how you bring people in, that is recruitment, how you retain them, that's retention, um, how you manage them while in the organization in terms of their training and development, and also their rewards and recognition. You need to reward them so that they can stay, right? And in a very competitive industry like this, you know, everybody is scrambling for stuff. So you probably have to reward them in order for them to stay with you and work with you. And in terms of training and development, because the standards are high in terms of customer service, you need to properly train your staff to get up to speed with, um, with the customer service requirements that are needed. In a similar vein, the type of product sold also varies over the course of the year for obvious reasons. All those sudden change in the weather and 
um, emerging harsh conditions are some of the causative factors. Now, when I read stuff like emerging harsh economic conditions, one of the frameworks that come to mind is the PESTEL framework, which looks at the political, economic, economic factors, and as well as um, economic factors, as well as um, social, you have social factor, tech factors, you have technological factors, you have um, ecological, environmental factors, you have legal factors. So here we are looking at um, the economic conditions. It's very, very important. What are the economic conditions surrounding the industry, surrounding the industry? The type of products sold varies, right? So different times of the year would, would determine the demand during those times of the year are different, different. Product availability is another challenge. So here we are looking at the supply chain, right? Because Bazaar Limited will get, you know, the product from somewhere else, from a manufacturer, from a seller, from a supplier, right? That's very, very important. So we are looking at how reliable even that supply is to provide the product because product availability is another challenge, as you can see here. And this is due to COVID, which is disrupting the global supply chain systems. That's why I mentioned. So supply chain here is key. Supply chain is basically um, how inputs are supplied and goes through the entire chain um, that eventually gets to the customer, right? So before you buy something at a store, it has moved from the supplier to a middleman, to a seller before it eventually gets to you. Where is the recent war between Ukraine and Russia affecting supply? So this is political factors. These are political factors that are affecting you know, the industry. So definitely I'll study more on the pestle framework. Please remember this, please. For, you know, study more and brush more on the pestle framework. You know, political factors, you look at stuff like government policy, political stability or instability, foreign trade factors, stuff like that. Economic factors, you are looking at economic growth, inflation, exchange rate, et cetera. Social factors, you are looking at population growth, age, distribution, health consciousness, et cetera. Technological factors, you are looking at um, emerging technologies, um, you know, the way goods and services are produced in a more advanced technological manner, environmental or, or ecological factors. You are looking at stuff like pollution, greenhouse gas emission, you know, stuff like that, carbon footprint, legal factors, you know, the laws surrounding the industry. So I'll definitely take a look at the labor, the pestle framework, sorry, the pestle framework. Um, as with all supermarkets, the company relationship with its customers is vital. Bazaar's relationship with supply chain stakeholders has been positive, although perceived to be abusive, especially when it favors Bazaar. So the relationship with your supplies is key because you depend on them for your products, you know, but the case is telling us here that um, it's sometimes perceived to be abusive, you know, but you would want a very, very good relationship with um, your suppliers. And I'll touch more on, on that when I talk about, um, when I talk about the ported value chain analysis, right? You know, it basically shows you how value is transformed from an input to an output. And we are told here that this is usually done with impunity as confirmed by some suppliers. So sometimes bazaar can be abusive, right? So bringing all of this together, I'm sure you've picked up some key models here. You've taken some essential notes here. And I would want you to, you know, this is only the first page. So you see my approach to, or approach to analyzing the case study, you bring up out the nuggets from the case. 
So this is essentially the part one. This is an introductory session just to get you um, started on it. Um, I'll be posting part two, part three, part four, as we go deeper and deeper into the case. Um, thank you. And if you haven't looked at my lecture on strategic models, please do so because it's important. There are some models you need to know to pro properly analyze the case. Thank you very much and have a good one. Bye-bye.